Hey, good morning, everybody. Let me, uh, let me see if I can. I am the CTO of Cloudflare, so if I can't plug this in, I'm in serious trouble. OK, so uh, my talk is, will machine learning replace the WAF? And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I actually do have a few more slides than that. Um, so I'm the CTO of Cloudflare. I've been at Cloudflare for a long time. This isn't a vendor talk, but some of this is based on our experience at Cloudflare. And some of it is based on my experience with filtering stuff, uh, in particular filtering spam, going back about 20 years. So we're going to talk about, we're going we're gonna to jump back 10 years, we're going to jump back 20 years to try and see what those experiences can teach us about uh, what's happening right now, which is there's lots of AI and machine learning things happening, lots of attacks happening on the web, and uh, what are we going to do about them? Um, and uh, let me make my machine work. Okay, what I mean by a WAF is software that filters HTTP requests. Um, the reason I specify that here is that the term WAF sometimes gets used for other meanings. Um, I, yeah, go ahead. I am not interested in. Can we keep speaking? Okay, uh, I'm not particularly interested in speaking about the IP-based blocking because I think that blocking via IP address is, um, it's not completely terrible. There are a very, very small percentage of IP addresses that are always malicious, uh, but the reality is that IP-based blocking is a really bad idea overall, especially because lots of people are on shared IP addresses. If you're using a mobile phone, it's very likely that your IP address is, is shared unless your mobile operator is using IPv6 which is wonderful. So this is all going to be about, really, about filtering HTTP requests. Um, so I want to go back 10 years. And uh, so I joined Cloudflare in 2011. And one of the first things I did at Cloudflare was write Cloudflare's WAF. Um, and so that's really my origin story around WAFs, is that when I got to Cloudflare, the CEO gave me a list of things I could work on. One of them was a compression technology which I worked on initially, um, and then we needed a new WAF. And the reason why we needed a new WAF was that this was the architecture of Cloudflare at the time. So on the right-hand side, you have a browser. Somebody goes to a website that uses Cloudflare, right? And Cloudflare is a reverse proxy, and it hits Nginx. And let's ignore the WAF for a minute. The normal flow would be, OK, this is actually for this particular site, example.com goes to cache, is it in cache? By the way, cache was another instance of Nginx. And if it isn't in cache, go out, reverse proxy out to the real web server, get the content, and go all the way back and serve it to the end user. And that was the architecture of Cloudflare. And Cloudflare's initial business was security, and that still is obviously a very large business. Um, and the way in which Cloudflare actually, it, the WAF we sold right at the beginning in 2011 was Apache running mod security with the core rule set. Um, <laughs> and the way in which that worked was that we put another Nginx, because we like putting Nginx in front of things. At this, at this time, we just, whenever we saw a problem, we put Nginx in front of it. Um, that's not true anymore. But at the time, so if you went into the Cloudflare and you enabled the WAF, then the request coming in before it went anywhere would get sent to another Nginx, which would get sent to Apache. And you might say, why the hell wasn't it sent directly to Apache? Why was there another Nginx? And the reason was Apache kept falling over because of the load we kept putting on the system. Um, and we had problems. So we put this Nginx in there to protect it. Um, and there were all sorts of limitations here. We, we couldn't deal with large request bodies. We, there were all sorts of things we did. So um, the CEO said to me, please write something new. We need something to replace Apache and Mod Security in our environment. We need to manage it ourselves. And so I did this. I got rid of an Nginx, which, you know, Cloudflare, you get money for getting rid of an Nginx, basically. Um, and I wrote a new WAF that ran inside Nginx itself um, using Nginx Lua. So Nginx has this Lua JIT functionality, and it is very, very fast. And I basically said, right, what I'm going to do is write a brand new WAF that runs in there, and I'm going to make it compatible with mod security. And so what I did was I duplicated the entire mod security language um, in Apache comp file format and allowed us to ingest that. So any rules that were written outside, could we could ingest. If a customer wrote a rule, we could ingest it. And I even took the test suite that comes with mod security, and I wrote brand new code 
that passed the test suite, basically. Um, and it was kind of ugly. So what happened was you take something like this from mod security, a very simple rule, um, and you know, this is the format of it, right? And we parsed that, um, parsed it in a really, really hideous Perl script. Um, so the, the, the Perl script was meant to last a short while, um, because I was just, the, the real WAF was like the nice code, and then there was this, this ugly thing doing the parsing, and so I just did that. The Perl script actually lasted about 10 years. Um, until somebody replaced it with something better. Uh, and there were no comments in, the, in this Perl script at all, and it used GoTo. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it probably should be in a museum or something hideous. Um, what happened was th this would get parsed into a JSON object by the, by the Perl script, which, which basically made it a little bit more parsable by something else. And something else would turn that into a piece of Lua. And so what actually happened was the rules that were written in mod security syntax were stuffed into a, into a Lua file and actually executed by, um, by Nginx, directly inside Nginx. But this is doing exactly what mod security was doing. The same kind of transformations, the same kind of regular expressions, all the same kind of stuff. Um, and it looked kind of like this. This is an actual real example of the actual Lua code. Um, and this lasted at Cloudflare for about um, eight years, uh, this was used, actually nine years, this was used, this was the WAF that Cloudflare used. And it was very, very successful and very, very fast because Lua is very fast. Um, and if you want to know more about that, or if you're curious about what I look like with black hair, instead of going gray, um, I gave a talk about this 10 years ago at Nginx Conf, and you can, you can see all the details of how it was done. But that was very successful, but then, uh, in 2022, we launched this. Um, we launched an improvement to the WAF that used machine learning. And I'm going to talk about the details of it in a little bit. But the real question is, why did we have to do that? Like, Why was it the case that the thing we were doing, which was using CRS, which was using custom written rules, which we were writing and other things, why was machine learning um, a part of this? And this wasn't an attempt to be cool, right? Had it been an attempt to be cool, we would have called this improving the WAF with AI. Um, I wish we didn't. We were, what we were doing was we were doing something which was really needed uh, by our platform. Now, to give you an idea of the scale of Cloudflare, we do about roughly 80 million HTTP requests per second for our customers. Um, and most of those go through the WAF. And so you're having a very, very high rate of uh, looking, looking for requests. We handle about one in five websites. Um, and so the variety of traffic we have is enormous. And the number of attacks we see are enormous and very, very varied across, across the world. Um, and we're present in 320 cities around the world. And so we see a huge amount of traffic. It has to be very fast. A lot of optimization work was done on the Lua code. Um, but we're tending to see things that are new um, and that are widespread as well. So what were the problems? Well, our experience with WAFs is there are really three problems that occur. One is it takes time to write a rule when something new comes along. If you're lucky when there's a new kind of attack, um, something else catches it, right? But what happens is very often, WAFs have been tuned, perhaps by us, perhaps by a customer, uh, to reduce false positives. That reduces their sensitivity because you don't want overblocking, right? And that means when something new comes along, you have an issue, which is often you miss it because it looks very, very different. And over the like ten or so years I've been working on this Cloudflare, there have been a few times where um, things have come along that WAFs were quite bad at blocking initially. Um, most notably shell shock, I remember that very, very well. That was fairly simple. It was a simple pattern, but no one was really blocking it. The second thing is that attackers and attacks actively evade WAFs. We all know about this, right? So if you've ever used to have done something with a WAF, um, people will try all sorts of obfuscation. And if you look in mod security, you look in our WAF and all those sorts of things, there's all sorts of de-obfuscation stuff, right? Oh, well, this is URL encoded, I'll un-URL encode it. This is HTML entity encoded, I'll undo that. I'll unbase 64 it. There's all these kind of things. And, um, or, you know, in HTML world, I'll insert all sorts of things to try and make this not look like the SQL injection I'm actually doing. And I think from a computer science perspective, 
Um, in some ways, WAFs are intractable because what you're trying to do is recognize at one level of abstraction, actually when a request comes in, something that another system will find malicious. You know, for example, for a SQL injection, it can look, something can look odd to a human, but innocent uh, up front, and actually once it gets transformed into something in the back end, maybe that becomes a SQL injection. And it's very, very hard to actually spot those things. And if you add on top of that evasion, it becomes very hard. Anyone who dealt with Log4j, the Log4j thing uh, in 2021, uh, would have seen how fast the, the evasion happened. And also this problem of different levels of abstraction, right? Something that was this JNDI thing coming into the front end would actually get treated by some Java thing way down, way down the stack. Um, the other thing is it's hard to detect new unseen attacks. WAFs are really good at things that we've seen before, and that's fantastic because a lot of hackers use the same tools and try the same stuff over and over again. You absolutely need to have a WAF or something similar in front of your thing, but it can be hard to detect very new unseen attacks. So, one of the things we've seen, because we can measure this, is that the time between a proof of concept being published on the web and exploitation is in the order of minutes. So, um, uh, what we see is you know, 22 minutes, this is the JetBrains one uh, in March, that was 22 minutes from the POC to the first ex attempts at exploitation by people. Um, there's a huge number of these things, right? This is from a year ago, 100, zero days, 29,000 new CVEs. And now, it's hard for us as people who are managing WAFs to just be fast enough. Now, you, you see a POC, how fast can you write the rule? And in Cloudflare, we can, if we've written a rule, we can deploy it in literally seconds globally, but that doesn't really matter. You've got to have the analyst time, understanding it, writing something, testing it, all this kind of stuff. So this is a really big problem for WAFs um, when new things come along, because it, the exploitation happens really, really fast. Um, to give you an example of this, so December 9th, 2021, uh, you had this tweet. This was from somebody who worked for Alibaba, saying there was a remote code execution in Log4j uh, using JNDI. Um, and they just published this simple thing saying, look, if you do this, this will happen. Um, it took nine minutes from that tweet to the first time we saw an attempt to use it on our, on our web. And so, you know, that, that wasn't even a coordinated disclosure or something like that. That was just a tweet. And this is the first day of, um, first, from the first day of things we were blocking that had the log4j signature in it. Um, and you see it really ramps up on the second day um, after it came out to, you know, tens of thousands per, per minute. Um, but it was really, really fast, nine minutes. And so there is difficulty in patching a WAF fast enough. No matter how fast your WAF patching infrastructure is, just writing the rule is hard. Um, and the other thing that happened with log4j was evasion happened really fast. So this is the actual original exploit that the person from Alibaba tweeted. Uh, I just changed the name of the domain. But it was the user agent field, classic user agent field. They put it in a number of other fields, referrer. And it's just that bit that says, you know, dollar paren, JNDI, LDAP, blah. Um, and pretty simple, pretty simple for a WAF to block that. You're looking for dollar bracket, you know, JNDI. Unfortunately, Log4J had a really, really, really rich language for writing what they call these lookups. And that is great for evasion. You know, whenever you have something like that, you you know you're you're in uh, you know you're in you're in trouble. So um, what happened was immediately after that, people with WAF started blocking the JNDI thing, and the hackers did this. So these are just these are real examples of all of these things on the screen. Each of these lines actually turns into dollar curly bracket JNDI colon. Um, and it's because the language was so rich. And so, you know, the, the first one is they have a lowercase function, and you can record it recursively, and they have an uppercase function. So they, you can kind of see in there J, N, D, I, and then you do uppercase and lowercase, and it eventually expands out to that. The next one is they have a thing where you can look something up in the environment, and if it isn't there, replace it with some value. So they look up some environment variable that doesn't exist, and then replace it with J, N, D, I, right? The next one is like a really weird bit of syntax where if it doesn't understand what's going on, it gives you the third parameter. Um, and all sorts of variants. And then the last one is, well, we'll do all of that and we'll do, you know, we'll URL encode it. 
And there were tons of these. And to give you a sense of this, um, this is what it looked like. So these are different evasion techniques. Remember, this was December 9th, 14, around 1500 UTC. So by December 10th, um, you, know, you had people using URL encoding um, straight away. You had the original exploit. And then you had people starting using the lower casing thing and then other techniques. And so you had, there was, there was a real battle for WAFs right at the beginning to try and figure out what are we going to do. And ultimately, you know, um, at one point we even considered actually running the actual JNDI, the, the actual lookup parser, to try and figure out like what things were. I actually wrote some Java code that would do that. But you can't do that in a, a WAF that's trying to be low latency. So, okay, so how can machine learning kind of improve this situation? So here's what we did at Cloudflare. What we're interested in is, how can we act, react quickly? How can we deal with these evasion techniques? And how can we, um, you know, when, when we see, um, something new, how can we spot it before, before we know what it is? So our real interest was, can we do all those sorts of things together? And this is where machine learning can really help you because machines can be very, very fast. So you can deal with that 22 minute, you know, problem or nine minute exploitation problem. You can probably deal with some of the evasion techniques. Um, and you can probably spot things that are new. So what we did was we looked at um, data from our network. And so we said, look, we've got an enormous amount of data of HTTP requests. And we also have a WAF that's blocking stuff. And so we can take stuff and we can say, you know, the WAF has told us this type of HTTP request is good and this type of HTTP request is bad. Um, and so we were able to build this big, big training set and say, this, these, things, these things look good and these things look bad. We had a bunch of things we had to do. We had to make sure we labeled stuff correctly. We had to make sure we weren't heavily imbalanced. Um, we had to make sure we weren't including PII in the data. There's lots of sanitization stuff to do. But you can get a training set out of these two things. Um, and then what we did was we said, okay, that's great. And so if you were to do that, you could build that training set and you could build something. You could build a machine learning WAF just from that. Um, you could use a classifier. We actually tend to use cat boost, but there are other you know, ways in which you could do it. And you could just say, look, this will recognize good and bad stuff. And as long as you're careful about your data set, um, you, can, you can build something really good. And what I mean by careful is you have to be um, careful not to be focused on a particular geography. And that sounds like a funny thing to say, but for example, if all your entire training set is in English, and someone starts using a UTF-8 characters, it could look like bad behavior. Of course, it's not. So you, we were lucky because we had such a big amount of data. But then what we did was we said, OK, look, what we really want to do is take things that are bad examples and add noise to them, a bit like someone who's trying to do evasion, and augment them. So we, and we've written this up. I can send people um, details of this. So what we did was we'd take something that was, you know, was we know we knew was bad, and then we would augment it with other stuff, um, and we would create either you know new benign content or new bad content. So we would we build this. So we we greatly enhanced the training set with things that looked a bit like the thing we had before, um, and then we built a very fast classifier. Uh, we use TensorFlow Lite. Um, obviously, we use PyTorch as well and TensorFlow at the beginning. But TensorFlow Lite has worked very very well for us, um, and so we can we can build this thing. And uh, it runs on about 17% of our global traffic. So, you know, ten, so, you know, millions and millions of requests per second. And um, to give you an idea, the latency, the P90 latency, you know, so 90% of requests take under a millisecond for the classifier to look at to make a decision about uh, whether that is a bad or a good request. So this does work. It does work. Um, and we deployed it. Um, and so what happens is, um, this is how it actually works. So this runs in line, HTTP traffic coming through us, we take the raw HTTP request, we do do some normalization and transformation. So you know, if it's a URL, we'll do URL decode. Um, and then we do classic machine learning stuff. And what the output of this is, is a score of how bad this thing is, or how good this thing is, what we, what we think this request is like. Um, and you know, if the score is low, then a customer can choose to block it. They can actually access that score and make a decision about it. And what we tend to see is the scores tend to be very bimodal. They tend to be either very low or very high. Things are either obviously clean or obviously bad. Um, there's not so, so much stuff in the middle. Um, and, you know, we can show this to customers so they can see, see, see what they're looking at. 
And here's the thing. This turns out to work really, really well um, for evasion techniques because of that augmentation we did where we fiddled around with the quest to make things look slightly different. Um, it's very fast. Um, and it's, um, it's finding CVEs before they're released. And so what's happening is we're seeing new signatures as things are actually um, tried by hackers. Uh, we're picking them up in the machine learning side before they become public. So that's why this was called detecting zero days before zero day, because we're having success in finding stuff before um, it ever was out there. And um, that's pretty exciting, because we want, we want to be able to stop that stuff. Um, and so, you know, we have lots and lots of examples of this. And actually, interestingly enough, when Log4j happened, we ran backwards through some of our logs to see, could we have found Log4j had this been deployed? And the answer was yes. Even more interestingly, we were able to see when the original researchers found this vulnerability, they tested it. And they tested it on a website that uses Cloudflare. And this is one of the things I really like about hackers, and I'm very thankful for. Um, they often test their attacks on Cloudflare, which is great, because then we can see their attacks. Um, and the fact we knew from the data that Alibaba had tried it, they tried two requests, that was it, they knew it worked. It was a website they controlled, so there's no problem. Um, and then nothing happened after that until the day of, uh, of the POC being released, and then nine minutes later all hell let loose. So machine learning can definitely, definitely help, right? But this has not replaced the WAF with signatures. And we don't think it will. We, we don't think it will. And actually, um, we think that the signatures are a really, really important part of this because how do you know what you should look for? You need to tell the machine learning system something about what's good and what's bad. And the signatures are, are the thing to do that. So actually, um, we think, and the reason why I said no at the beginning of this talk rather jokingly, is that although machine learning will be an incredible help and something which we should be using for WAFs, um, uh, you know, we think they're here to stay. You know, we can get tons of traffic, right? But we have we have signatures, and we have to look at you know interesting new stuff, interesting, and that way we can build a better training set. So I think that what's going to happen with WAFs, at least from our perspective, is um, we won't rely so much on signatures as the actual thing that does blocking all the time, but we will rely it on a way to tell a machine learning system what they should be looking for, and it can then learn from that. Um, so this is really this is what we're doing today. Um, you know, we get signatures. CRS has been fantastic. A lot of our own stuff that we've written, customer written signatures. We build a model, we deploy it, we look at interesting traffic, stuff that is like that the machine learning model has perhaps identified as malicious, but might not have matched an original signature. That might just be the signature didn't catch it, but it might actually be something that's new or related that we, is actually worth looking at. Or sometimes those things in the middle, if the score is not at one end or the other, it's like, hmm, why is, this, why is the model unsure about this thing? So worth looking at, write new signature, and loop this around. And we do this constantly. Um, but I want to go back 20 years. So I went back 10 years to 2014 when I wrote the WAF for Cloudflare, and I want to go back 20 years uh, prior to that. So 20 years ago, uh, I was very involved in spam filtering. So um, if you were, if you're old enough to remember, but at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, email spam was a huge problem, and it was a huge problem because we were, most of us were downloading our mail onto our devices, onto our computers, using mail programs, and you were wasting your connection. Your connection might have been dial-up. I mean, it was a mess, right? And so spam filtering became a really, really big deal. Um, and um, the way in which spam filters worked at the time was keywords. Um, and this is actually, uh, this is a dialogue screen from Eudora, the mail program Eudora from the turn of the century. And it had this thing where you can kind of see here these chili peppers. And these chili peppers, it had a feature called mood watch. And this was very like a spam filter, it worked very like a spam filter. And it would warn you if the message you were sending was, was potentially offensive. It would look at your, and it was done with keywords, right? Oh, and this was exactly how spam filters really worked. They had a list of keywords, Viagra, that was a very popular keyword, and all this kind of stuff. Well, imagine if you were called this. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
everybody who emailed me got warned that they were being offensive. Um, and so the problem with these filter techniques is you have this incredible false positive problem, right? And what happened was the spammers saw that people were doing this kind of um, filtering on keywords, and they tried all sorts of tricks to make it impossible to do. Um, and so this is the thing I worked on, which was to look at their techniques. So this is one where they used HTML to send, I added the red lines, they sent every letter separately as, as a part of a table, but in columns, right? So if you were a spam filter, you couldn't see, you know, Viagra or whatever else the words were, but it got nicely portrayed in your, in your email client. Um, there's another one, they used, uh, they used different colors, so they, what they did was they put white on white, so they tried to hide they hide, hid some words and showed some words. Again, try and confuse things. A lot of this sort of stuff is similar. Um, just not using spaces, you know? Don't use spaces between things. Why not do that? We'll just, humans will read this. Um, or don't use spaces but make the color slightly different so you're sort of readable. All of these things to try and trick very simplistic filters. Um, misspell things. It turns out that actually humans are really good at reading words if the first and last letter are in the correct place, and you can read this uh, with no problem, even though the, even though it's completely wrong, right? The letters are all messed up, messed up. Um, but they, this trick, something's very simplistic. Um, or you do this: you use a table to put colors and spell the word you want. Again, trying to trying to trick a spam filter. So what happened was I worked on a thing that used um, machine learning. Um, so this is from uh, Dr. Dobbs in 2005, a naive Bayesian text classification, which is very simple machine learning way of looking at text. Um, and I wrote a quite popular spam filtering thing called PopFile, which is an open source project, and used it to, to do filtering. And it turned out that machine learning was really, really, really good at spam filtering, even this fairly simplistic model of text classification. And you didn't need to tell it a lot, but you need to point it in the right direction. So there were certain things that we did, which was to tell it consider the subject line differently from the body, for example. Or parse out HTML so that you get the attributes out of it. So this is very analogous to what we're doing with the machine learning wow for Cloudflare, which is you, know, you give it a bunch of signatures, and the machine learning model then goes off and identifies what is spam. And it was hugely successful. Um, the really interesting thing was, the more the spammers tried, the, the better the machine learning model was. So, for example, this was from a presentation. I, these are all old slides from 20 years ago. Um, this, is the, this is the word Viagra, written out using HTML entities, using fonts that are either zero width, so they, the letter disappears, or normal width, so it actually spells out Viagra, but it's mixed up with other stuff. Um, this, this fools a simple filter. It actually... A machine learning filter loves this, because a machine learning filter will look at it and go, font size zero, that is clearly a, a sign. So actually, the more you obfuscated stuff, the more it became trivial to spot and filter. So actually, machine learning was really, really powerful. And it actually, at the time, we absolutely had an edge over, uh, over the people who were spamming. And today, of course, spam is still out there, but you know, most of it's in your spam folder, because machine learning works great for it. Um, and one of the things spammers tried to do is this. They tried then saying, I'm going to beat the machine learning spam filter. Right? And so this is what's going to happen with machine learning WAFs. Is the people attacking them are going to say, how do I evade the WAF? And that, this is what I thought was really interesting was, at the time what the spammers did was they said, if we throw in a whole load of random words, then the machine learning thing will think, oh, this is genuine text. It's not, and it, though, the probability of those words will overwhelm the thing that's saying the probability of this thing is spam. And they tried that. It didn't work very, very well. The reason it didn't work very, very well is that most people don't write random words. Their actual, their actual vocabulary is, is, you know, specific to them. Um, but this was an attempt, and this was a real attempt to evade, evade those filters. And so I asked myself a question, which is what happens if the spammers start using machine learning, what can they do? This was a presentation from 2004. Um, and I said, okay, so I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna actually take my spam filter that I've written, pop file, the yellow one, that was the logo, and I'm gonna take an evil version, right? And I'm going to spam myself by adding random words, just like the spammers are doing, 
And every time a message gets through, i.e. gets read by the end user, i.e. it means it wasn't filtered, I'm going to put a little HTML pixel in there, which is going to tell me, the spanner, that message got through. And I will know which words I stuffed into that message. And I will then train my evil spam filter saying, aha, this message with this set of words got through. Now, of course, I didn't know which, the, which words were specifically the ones that were causing the good spam filter to mistakenly think it was a good message. But if you sent enough messages, what would happen is the evil filter would learn how to evade the good filter. And it worked great. It worked absolutely great. Um, I, d I termed this kryptonite. If you sent me a spam and you included Berkshire comment Marriott touch or wireless, it just sailed right through the spam filter. The machine learning was like completely blinded by it. Um, and there were some other words, but those were the key ones. Those were the key ones. And so the thing was, this was really, really practical. And um, that worried me a lot because I thought this is what, you know, this is what's going to happen. We're going we're gonna to have this. And I think what's going to happen soon is that uh, attackers are going to start using machine learning against, against us with WAFs. And um, I came to this conclusion that the only way to do this was, well, there were lots of things we could do, rendering HTML and stuff like that. But the key thing was to make sure that the spammer didn't know their message got through. Because as soon as you gave them feedback, then they can start training their own thing. And unfortunately, in WAFs, we give loads of feedback. You've been blocked. Oh no, 200 OK. So I have a prediction, which is that we are going to actually have to start filtering bad requests and replying 200 OK. So we're going to actually have to remove the thing we think is bad and just let the request go through. Otherwise, what will happen is the bad guys will say, right, I am going to hit this website with variants of what I want to do to get through until it gets accepted. Now, people do this today, right? They try, you know, you see, you see hackers out there saying, I can evade the Cloudflare WAF by adding percent, blah, blah, blah. you know, they, they found a way. They were just as much as we have automated the signature to, you know, blocking by using machine learning. They can do the opposite, which is automate the evasion. And so I think there's going to have to be a change in how we do stuff. And this hasn't been implemented in Cloudflare. This is my opinion that prevents hackers from knowing that their request got through. There you go, that's me. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Thank you very much. I'm Are there any questions? Yeah, I'm happy to answer questions if you want. If we've got a microphone right here, if you want to, if you have a question, please just come up to the microphone. Bummer, but I don't have a question. But it was a fantastic talk mixing a conceptual with a technical presentation. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thank you. John, thanks for the great talk. A uh, question that I have about the score is, did you also use confidence level? How confident you are when you're assigning the score? Um, so we do in terms of the actually when the model is running, right? So when you're actually building the model, you are, it's iterative, right? So you're outputting, okay, this is what we think the score is, and this is the delta from what you can, if, if we know, like for example, if we know something is malicious, the score should be zero, right? And so you get this, you know, okay, how close are we? So you are at that point, but we're not presenting to the end user, oh, it's a nine with a confidence inf yeah, interval of something. Um, we could do, I think that, the reality is that we've seen it be so bimodal that it's almost almost pointless. But it's an interesting idea. I, I will talk to the team about it because I don't think we've thought about it as a, you know, we could have cf.waf.score. You know, interval. That's a great. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you for the presentation. It was amazing, to be honest. At the beginning, I was thinking this is going to be another vendor one, but it was really nice, technical. By any chance, if this is selfish, are you going to publish that data set? It's going to be public to consume as an open source, to us duplicate or, or verify the results? That was the first question. And the second one, 
is um, the model, right? So you cannot overfit the model to just be perfect to your data set, otherwise you are not able to generalize. What was your fallback technique? If you couldn't detect if it's let it go or not, did you block it by default, or you have a fallback to, to, to decide is this a malicious attack or not? So, I mean, that was one of the big problems, right, is labeling everything. Now, we, we, we know from WAF data, you know, software blocking, of course, there could be false positives in there. Um, there's a really interesting thing, right, which is that if I go back to when I was doing the spam filtering, one of the techniques that made it work really, really well was when it filtered something as a spam or as a good message, we actually retrained the model on that message. And that seems really surprising, right? Because you're like, wait a minute, wouldn't that, what if, you're, what if you made a mistake? But it turns out that um, because of the, the error rate was relatively low, um, it actually got dramatically better. So you'd say, oh, this thing is a spam, and we were pretty confident it was a spam. We will retrain on everything in here as if it was a spam, and it actually caused the errors to diminish, not actually increase. So even though you got the occasional error, it didn't cause probabilities to mess up so much. So we're not too worried about this, um, but yes, we did, we did a bunch of labeling work at the beginning to make sure. So there was a lot of get the, get the data labeled, get it sorted out so we're pretty confident that what we've got in there is correct. And the other big problem was, you know, although we see billions of WAF blocks per day, we see many orders of magnitude not WAF blocks. So you can get uneven amounts of data. So you have to take that into account as well. But yeah, in terms of open sourcing it, we have not open sourced the code for it, but we've written up very detailed how to do this using CatBoost. So if you want to know how to do it, I mean, it's no... We don't consider this to be a secret. You know, it's like, you can go do it. But what about the data set? So what about what? The, the data set, right, that, that's the meaty part. I'm not sure I understand the question. The, the data set you, you use to train the oh, model? Oh, the data set itself? I really doubt we'd open source it. Because um, those are our customers' HTTP requests. So even if we sanitized it, right, even if we said we get rid of cookies, we get rid of IP addresses, we get rid of stuff like that, we would have to go to our customers and say, you know, you know, your customers made an HTTP request to Cloudflare. Are you okay without us opening that? And I just, I, I just don't know how we do it. Cool. No, thank you. Can Can I ask? Thanks a lot for amazing talk. Uh, I have a question for you about. Uh, poisoning attacks on the AI, like basically, is there any evidence that someone tried to craft malicious uh, requests and include some specific good data to make your AI believe that the good data is actually malicious, and what do you do about it if there's any attacks like that? So, no, not yet. <laughs> um, but the reason I wanted to talk about the spam filtering thing from 20 years ago was it will definitely happen. Right, and the, the, the tools will get in simpler. And also, here's a funny thing: when I was talking, when I, I gave a talk about those funny techniques the spammers were using to hide what they were doing, somebody from Google came up to me and said, "Oh, all of this has been done in the SEO world to try and trick the search engine." So it is absolutely the case that something like this will happen. It's just a question of you know when and but. It'll happen once there are more machine learning WAFs out there in particular, because you will want to be, you know, those WAFs will be worth breaking into right now. Right now, if you're motivated, you can probably sit down and craft a way to evade a WAF if you really want to. But once the WAFs get really good because of machine learning and spotting new stuff, then I think that's when the arms race really kicks off. Thank you. We'll take this last question. Yeah. All right, let's do it. And we'll break up. Um, on your last note of uh, tampering with the response from the, uh, with the request, removing the payload, malicious payload and yeah. sending it to the origin. Have you considered also kind of instead of uh, doing that, because it could be risky, I guess, tampering with the request, have you considered returning like a good enough mocked response that would still doesn't give any feedback to the attacker? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, 
the main thing is to make sure they can't distinguish between they've been blocked and they haven't been blocked, right? Because as soon as they can do that, then they can start learning. Um, one of the other things we did at Cloudflare, particularly for Log4j, was some of our customers wanted to have the actual malicious strings. Yeah. Uh, they wanted it passed all the way to the back, they, but they wanted us to sanitize it. And so we actually just removed the dollar from the beginning, because they were all dollar records. So we said, we'll send it to you without the dollar at the start. Um, and that was, that, that was good for them. That they, they wanted that. But yeah, they, but I don't know what the exact technique will be, but something that makes it indistinguishable between whether they've been blocked or not. Now on the back end, the customer needs to know, actually we block this request, right? Or actually we sanitize this request. But I think that's th that day is coming anyway. Okay, cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.